Thanks, Mike. <clears throat> so I'd like to begin with um, one of my favorite conjectures that comes from uh, random matrix theory. And so it starts with, uh, with this question, uh, which integers uh, m are the sum of two rational cubes? Uh, so for example, 6 is, as you can see there, and uh, so is uh, 346. Uh, here's a table that, uh, that some are made. Um, let's see, I guess I'm not sure exactly what year this is, but uh, basically uh, tells uh, the, the numbers A for which uh, you have infinitely many uh, solutions. <clears throat> and um, well, the situation is that if M is square free, so I'm just going to assume m is square free to simplify things, and also uh, not divisible by 3, also just to simplify things. But if m is uh, congruent to 4, 7, or 8 mod 9, then it's always expected that there's always a solution. Uh, whereas if m is uh, congruent to 1, 2, or 5 mod 9, then it's, it's rare that there's a solution. And so we want to focus on this situation when m is 1, 2, or 5 mod 9, uh, the times when it's rare that m will be a sum of uh, two rational cubes. And uh, we have this conjecture from uh, random matrix theory that the number of m's up to x for which this has a solution uh, should be uh, asymptotic to some constant times x to the 5, 6 times log x to this uh, strange power square root of 3 over 2 uh, minus 5 eighths. <laughs> I, have, I have the same question. The average number of is the average number of representations supposed to be a nicer? You mean if uh, if it's uh, no, that'll be. You mean if there's extra? Yeah. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. No. It's okay. If there's one solution, there's going to be infinitely. I mean, it's a rank thing, right? Oh, yeah. 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 And the, and the higher ranks will be, presumably, much smaller order of magnitude. I see. Yeah. So, uh, so I don't know what that means, the answer to your question is, but. <laughs> Are the two x's the same in that set? Oh, no, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily. <laughs> OK. But now, uh, OK, so that's not my favorite conjecture, but we're coming to it. So now, Mark Watkins actually uh, studied this. In fact, that, this, is, this conjecture is due to Mark Watkins. And uh, he computed this data for m up to about 10 million. And um, he, uh, if you separate the data, the m's in this rare situation, it, separate it, um, let's say, mod 7, for example. So look at all the m's in this rare situation. Uh, and look at a mod 7, and he found 125,000 values of m that are 2 uh, mod 7, but only 59,000 uh, m's that were, uh, that were 3 mod 7. Uh, now, you, would, you might expect that, that the m's would be evenly distributed mod 7 or you know, mod any sort of prime. And so that's the interesting thing, is that, um, is that you have this big discrepancy about how these rare uh, sums of two rational cubes are distributed mod mod 7, for example. And uh, <clears throat> OK, so what's uh, some of the number theory behind this uh, due to Gauss, basically. When, so when p is 1 mod 3, there's three solutions to 4p equals a squared plus 3b squared that have a congruent to 2 mod 3. And precisely one of these will have b divisible by 3. And the a corresponding to that one is what we'll call that a p1. So for example, if p is 7, 4p is 28, and here's uh, the way to write 28 as the sum of a squared plus 3b squared, with a being uh, 2 mod 3. Uh, and uh, one of these has uh, b divisible by 3, namely this one. And so a71 then uh, is defined to be minus 1. Okay? And if you count the number of solutions of x cubed plus y cubed congruent to m mod p, it'll be p plus 1 minus a p, uh, p m where uh, if, well, if p is 2 mod 3, then apm is 0. And if it's 1 mod 3, then it's the a 
uh, from this, which happens to be congruent to m to the p minus 1 over 3 uh, times ap1 uh, mod p. And uh, so with that definition of a p uh, b, let's say, then here's uh, Watkins' conjecture. So you count the, again, we're just going to stick to the rare m's, so the square free, the square free congruent to 1, 2, or 5 mod 9, the m's up to m, uh, such that for a, a given prime, m is congruent to b mod p versus m congruent to b prime mod p. And what you get is uh, what the conjecture that comes from random matrix theory is that it'll be square root of p plus 1 minus a p b over p plus 1 minus a p b prime. Okay, and in that example I gave you a second ago, where p is 7 and b is, one b is 2 and the other one is 3, you calculate the a's are negative 4 and 5, and you get 7 plus 1 minus a negative 4, 7 plus 1 minus 5, and that turns out to be 2. And so the conclusion is, the conjecture is, it's twice as likely that a number congruent to 2 mod 7 is the sum of 2 cubes as, oops, oh shoot as a number that is 3 mod 7. I don't know how to make that not. When you look through square free numbers congruent to 1, 2, or 5 mod 9. And so this, this is uh, my conject the conjecture that's my favorite one. Because you can say it just about numbers that are sums of two cubes. Uh, you don't have to mention elliptic curves, L functions, uh, random matrix theory, anything like that. Anybody could understand it. And, um, uh, uh, but it has, it has a nice simple statement with a very uh, arithmetic flavor. Now, uh, what's going on here is that there is an elliptic curve, the elliptic curve of conductor 27, and here's some data that Watkins found for different primes, 5, 7, 11, 13. And the primes that are 2 mod 3, like 5 and 11, you look through the rare solutions and see how they're distributed modulo the residue classes for those primes. And they're, just, they're basically just evenly distributed. Yeah? But for the, for the p's that are congruent to 1 mod 7, you find um, different distributions. And they're all basically, these, these can be arranged into three sets that are all about the same. Uh, and, uh, and the... Um, the conjecture is that one that, that Watkins uh, showed, or that, that I showed you from, uh, that Watkins made, and tells you how to explain the discrepancy in these numbers. Okay? So, uh, like I said, I, I really like this. It, re it requires random matrix theory. It doesn't seem to be possible to come up with this conjecture just using uh, arithmetic or number theory or geometry, or at least um, nobody has, uh, has proposed anything. And so I certainly, if you are interested, challenge you to see if you can come up with a, an explanation for that. But you mean an explanation for the precise value of the bias, right? Not just that there is a bias in favor of Yeah, no, the, yeah, the precise value of the bias. Uh, yeah. Although if you could come up with a reason that there should be a bias, that might be a, a step in the right direction. I don't know. Anyway, so as far as from random matrix theory, I think this uh, is right up there with the the prediction of this sequence. Uh, <laughs> I had to get that number on the board, right? <laughs> All right. <clears throat> okay, so we've already heard a little bit about this, but um, uh, so I just want to discuss how the random matrix theory does this, uh, how, where you, how you can come up with that conjecture from random matrix theory. And Chantal already talked about this a little bit, and Mike Rubenstein already talked about it a little bit, but um, let me just go ahead anyway. So you have an elliptic curve, uh, and uh, the rank is conjectured to be equal to the order of vanishing uh, at the central point. And we can study the value at the central point by using random matrix theory. And so that's the, the lead-in to these conjectures. Uh, we have the L function of the elliptic curve, and uh, it has a functional equation with a, a root number. And we think of when the root number is plus 1, the rank is usually 0, and the, when the root number is minus 1, the rank is, is usually 1. Uh, and so we want to take an elliptic curve, and what we want to do is uh, we want to twist by uh, the uh, quadratic twist. So twist by 
uh, the character chi d, uh, the Kronecker symbol. And uh, if summation a n over n to the s is the L function of the original elliptic curve, then if you multiply just by chi sub d of n, that'll be the L function of, of this twisted elliptic curve. And it has this functional equation. And we're interested in the case, the thing we're interested in is the case when the sign of the functional equation is plus one, so that if you have a zero at the central point, at the critical point, then it has to be a double zero. So that's the case that um, we're trying to say something about. So, and it's a pretty subtle thing. It doesn't happen very often, right? And so, uh, but now that's, uh, if Q is a conductor of your original elliptic curve, then the sign is just the sign of the original curve times chi D of minus Q. And so you can arrange that to be plus one just by having D in some arithmetic progression mod Q. So it's easy to work out how to make this always plus one. Uh, and like I said, the question we're interested in is, so how often do we get rank two? Uh, or if we look at the situation where the sign is always minus one, how often do we get rank three uh, in the family of quadratic twists of a, a fixed elliptic curve? And, um, and the expectation that comes from random matrix theory is that rank two will happen about x to the three quarters log x to the b, uh, where b can be one of, actually there's a fourth number that's not on here, but it depends on the, um, uh, the two torsion of the curve. And you can actually get you know, a, a square, uh, an irrat you have fractions in here, which already is surprising. We saw that that can't happen when counting fields, but um, not only that, but you can have a square root. Now, if, if you don't look over uh, all discriminants, but you just restrict the prime discriminants, then in fact, the power on the log we know is, uh, we expect to be minus five eighths all the time. So somehow, you get these uh, extra powers of log, they come from sort of Tamagawa factors, which affect kind of the discretization of the uh, central value by, um, uh, well, in a way that I'll just briefly mention when we get to it, but you get kind of divisor type functions. Uh, it sort of makes your, um, your L values uh, have a larger discretization with things that involve kind of divisor-like functions because of the uh, the Tamagawa uh, factors. Okay, so here's an example, uh, the elliptic curve with conductor 11, y squared plus y is x cubed minus x squared, np is the number of points, uh, mod p, and ap is defined like that, and uh, there's the uh, L function. Now in this case, you actually have a nice uh, uh, infinite product for the, uh, that tells you the an, of course that doesn't happen all the time, but for some elliptic curves, you have uh, this kind of thing. And here's the, the functional equation. Uh, and if you twist by uh, chi d, then um, that's what your Euler product looks like. And the um, functional equation is like this. This n here is 11, so it's chi d of minus 11. And that's the functional equation of the uh, twisted elliptic curve. And the formula for the central value is, um, the value at one half of Le uh, chi d is a uh, number kappa, related to the period, 2.9, and then times the square of an integer divided by the square root of d. So this is the um, discretization that I was talking about. And in fact, this C11 um, is, uh, whose square appears here, is an integer that can be found by just taking the, this combination of, the, of two theta series. So theta one is, uh, is this uh, theta series, and theta two is that. And so um, you can uh, use this formula then to, um, to figure out, uh, well, to figure out exactly what the, what the L value is. I believe this was originally due to, I think Gross found this uh, in the first place. Uh, but um, since then, um, lots and lots of uh, examples have been found, uh, many by Gonzalo uh, Ternaria, uh, in, uh, and that has led to uh, sort of many calculations, uh, calculations of many, many values of uh, central values of L functions, quadratic twists of L functions associated with elliptic curves. So now where does the random matrix theory come in? Well, um, 
the uh, L function uh, twisted by chi d is believed to have an orthogonal symmetry type. And so we compare, uh, if you compare moments of the L function with moments of orthogonal matrices, then they're expected to behave in similar ways. Uh, and in particular, we expect uh, moments to match up. And uh, well, let's see, there's some, uh, uh, some data for the first four moments that were computed by uh, Mike Rubenstein of these things. And uh, we got good agreement. Uh, and uh, this is a picture uh, showing the value distribution of uh, L, the central value. I, sometimes I have one here and sometimes I have a half here. Sorry about that. But with lots of values of D, and there's two curves here, a scatter plot and a, and a, um, and a curve. And there's, there's good agreement between the distribution of values of the L function, twist, the twisted L function at the central point, and uh, the distribution of values of orthogonal matrices of size n, where n is around log d. So can I ask, Brian, in a situation yeah. like this, if you put congruence conditions on d, at some prime that's like not super singular for e11, do you get different frequencies of vanishing? Oh, okay, so if you want to model like just d in some arithmetic progression, no, it'll be basically be uh, it'll basically be the same except for one sort of um, important uh, difference, uh, which has to do with sort of the uh, an Euler factor at the prime uh, that's the you know or the primes dividing the uh, modulus where you're looking at the residue class. But basically, if you, you can average a collection of uh, L, uh, LDs, D in an arithmetic progression, and they're still orthogonal, and so it still basically behaves the same way. The shape of this thing will be exactly the same. Yeah. Right, so, uh, so here's the formula of Keating and Snaith for the sth moment of orthogonal characteristic polynomials. So we're integrating with Haar measure over the 2n by 2n uh, orthogonal matrices, and this is the characteristic polynomial, absolute value uh, to the uh, sth power. And they found a, this very beautiful exact formula. So this is a theorem that they proved. This is, a, this is that integral. And the key thing here is that uh, if you look at the rightmost pole of, of this, okay, where is that? Well, it occurs when j is 1 and you have a gamma s plus half, which has a pole at s equals minus a half. Okay? And all the other poles are further to the left. So the, the point is the rightmost pole is at s equals negative a half. And that's, that half is that's where the square root comes from in those conjectures. And that's the part that I think is, would be very difficult to come up with uh, arithmetically. I mean, this is where the random matrix theory is definitely in there from the, the s equals minus a half where this pole uh, shows up. And so, um, well, uh, so the probability, so this is the, if you know all the complex moments of uh, these characteristic polynomials, then you know you can recover the distribution of values. And basically just by a, a Mellon transform, you can figure out that the, the probability of the value being alpha is essentially, well, you, uh, if alpha is small, you can move the path of integration over across a pole at s equals minus a half. And uh, you have a 1 over alpha here and an alpha to the plus 1 half from s equals minus a half. And so you get alpha to the minus half. And then all the rest of this stuff is, well, you have to do some asymptotics here with the Barnes function. That's that big G. But basically, you have a constant times alpha to the minus half and times n to the 3 eighths. And that n to the 3 eighths is the thing that's responsible for like the power of log being you know, minus 5 eighths when you twist by primes. But so this tells you exactly the probability of a characteristic polynomial from this uh, collection of matrices having a value, a small alpha, uh, having value alpha. Okay. And uh, the special value of the L function gives you this discretization 
Uh, we know what kappa is. CD is an integer. And so the point is, I mean, that if this L value is smaller than kappa over root D, then it has to be zero. And so you just calculate the probability that the L function, well, you model, you say that the L function behaves like the orthogonal matrices, and the probability that the L function is less than this will be connected to the probability that um, the uh, characteristic polynomial is less than that. And, but with, uh, with an important arithmetic factor, there's that arithmetic factor that occurs in the moment conjectures. Uh, it's a product over primes that's uh, specific to, uh, to the family, and, uh, and, that appear and that makes an appearance in here. So that's this a, a sub minus 1 half. It's kind of the arithmetic factor in front of the minus 1 half moment of the L functions. And that's what it is. Yeah? Can I just understand, I mean, in, in, I think it was in Mike's talk yesterday, there was a situation where the main term of an asymptotic was governed by something that was purely gained from the random matrix, and then the arithmetic term appeared as a fluctuation that was lower order. Here it looks like the arithmetic term is actually right. part yeah. of the constant. And that, what, what's the right. No, no, my, in my, if you look back at Mike's, the arithmetic factor is in the main term also. Uh, it, it's there too. It, it was in both places. Oh, so it's just the shape that Right. Absolutely by yeah. That. So you remember in the moment conjectures that Mike presented, like for you know the fourth moment of zeta, you have so there's an a a two and a g two, right? In, in general, for the two kth moment, there's an a k and a g k. So we've been focusing on the g k, you know, which is one, two, forty two, whatever. But the a k is that product over primes. It's sort of a, in some ways, it's easy to the, for the number theorists to see what that's supposed to be. I mean, we've known, you know, all the way back to, you know, days of Hardy and Littlewood, what that AK should be somehow with the moment. It's the, and, yeah. So, no, so that's there in the, in the moments. Yeah. Yeah, that is what I was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Okay, and so that's the difference between a sort of a local statistic and a global statistic, right? So a local statistic kind of had the zeros and correlations and neighbor spacings. We sort of call those local statistics. And the leading terms of those don't have any arithmetic factors, right? They just match up nicely with random matrix theory. But the lower order terms do have arithmetic. But the global statistics, like moments and stuff, the arithmetic shows up right away uh, in the main term. As I, yeah. Right, okay, thanks. Okay, uh, yeah, so, um, right, and so, uh, okay, so the point was, all right, the point is that with this, you see you have this minus one half here that, um, that came from that pole, and so, uh, so that means, so you take this, this square root of d here, you take it to the one half power, and uh, that gives you a d to the one quarter, and then when you sum that uh, for the probability of it's sort of an individual one vanishing, it's kind of proportional to one over d to the one quarter, and then when you sum that for d's up to x, that gives you the x to the three quarters. So that's where the x to the three quarters comes from, and you carry along the logs with you, and you have this extra log to the three eighths that comes from random matrix theory. Okay, and then, as I said, um, there's been a lot of numerical computation done with this uh, by Mike uh, and with the aid of uh, Gonzalo and uh, Fernando Rodriguez Viegas. And this shows, I don't know, just comparison of the curves. Here's with like 2,000 curves. So they've actually worked out 2,000 curves and sort of hundreds of millions of twists of these things. So there's just actually just a, a, an amazing amount of data to support this thing. Now, unfortunately, we don't know what the leading constant is. So all we are looking for is to have this thing be flat. Yeah. What? Right. Okay. So this is the data divided by the conjecture. And so it being flat is a good thing. But we don't know sort of what the constant is all the way up and down here. And that's something that's still being worked out. I know Mike's working on it. Uh, Christophe Delaunay has been working on it using a um, the uh, analog, uh, the uh, analog of, un, of uh, cohen lenstra heuristics, but for tate Shafarevich group. So that comes into the picture, but it's not explained yet. What's Maybe the difference between that cluster of curves yeah. at the top and like the big, such a thick cluster of curves? All oh, right. Uh, yeah, so somehow these things form the the size of the Korsman uh, subgroup of the underlying curves, and this cluster, if you were to look at the Curve, you know, there's two black, there's actually more hidden in there, but yeah, they seem to be the cluster according to the Korsman. 
this would be the, the it's a ratio of the, um, uh, the x to the 3 quarters log x to the whatever divided by the actual number of vanishings that you found. And so we don't know what the constant is. <laughs> uh, that's a frustrating thing. Isn't this showing the constant is different for each curve? Right. The here the constants are varying sort of between 0.2 and 0.8. And so we'd like to say for each individual curve, what is that constant? We don't know. But that's where this experiment, uh, so here's, this shows that the things are really flat. And, uh, but this experiment um, about taking the ratios in, I mean, about looking at how these things get distributed in arithmetic progressions um, is a really nice test for the whole theory because it, the constant cancels out. So you do your average for your L function uh, over one arithmetic progression or over a different arithmetic progression. You're going to have the same uh, C sub E out front, the same power of X, the same power of log X. So everything cancels out, and so you just end up with a constant here. And the surprising thing is that the constant's not one. I mean, when we first did it, we were completely shocked. You know, we had like uh, tons of data for twisting uh, L11, uh, E11, and we had a list of all the you know rank twos or you know even bigger than zero ranks. And we just took that data and we just sorted it into, you know, mod uh, five, mod seven, mod 11, and we're shocked to find that you know, that the things were, um, were diff that the numbers came out differently. And so then we thought about how to explain it and realized, well, you know, we, can, we have these conjectures for moments of L functions. We just do the conjecture, but for uh, over a, uh, an arithmetic progression, uh, over two different arithmetic progressions, and the conjectures come out uh, exactly the same except for one, except for the, that arithmetic factor at the prime. Uh, that you're doing your congruence for, and that turns out to be exactly this. And uh, the, uh, here's data, the, the first original data we had for the three curves, 11, 19, and 32. And uh, the conjectured here, that's always the square root of some rational number in these columns. And here's the actual data, and you just look, and it, I mean, it agrees, you know, three decimal places sort of all over the whole thing. It's just complete uniform agreement. I mean, it's, uh, it's completely convincing. And when you take a CM curve, when your A is zero, then the answer should be that it should be uh, uniformly distributed. And there we actually have uh, much better agreement, like agreement to you know, four or five decimal places, wherever there's a one there. And that's because uh, sort of the lower order terms that Mike was explaining are the same in those. And so uh, you don't have a variation in those things. Anyway, okay, so that's the end of that. Uh, but now, uh, but this, but I want to, so the point of this talk is that we can apply this same idea in a whole bunch of different situations, or, which have been done uh, a couple of things, but there's a lot that haven't been done that I'm hoping somebody will do. And so the point of the talk is to get you interested in trying to do this sort of thing, but in other families of L functions. And, uh, but before I do that, I just wanted to, there's something Mike and I uh, looked at which was, we sorted the data. Can you see the colored dots on there? There's blue up here and black down here. A purple, okay, yeah. And um, the idea was that the, uh, we sorted, one of the things we did in trying to figure out what the constant was for each curve, you know, those, we have that range of constants, and we're trying to work that out, was to calculate the, the group of points uh, mod p for each of these things. And uh, that should, in general, that's a product of two cyclic groups, but sometimes it's just one cyclic group. And uh, so the black dots are when it's just one cyclic group, and the purple dots are when it's a product of two. And there just seems to be, uh, that it seems like that has something to do with what the constant is. <laughs> yes? Well, there's a problem. Uh, I mean, you have problems with some small primes, like two, for example. I mean, it's the same thing that Heath Brown ran into when he was doing his conjectures for Selmer groups. So there's an issue about exactly how to, to sort the things, uh, you know, what, exactly what's the right experiment to do. And uh, I don't know, Mike uh, can give some information about that. Not right now, but, um, <laughs> but uh, I think he might be close to uh, getting, a, getting that, uh, nailing that constant.
Uh, and so it would be really good if he would do that this uh, semester. Yeah. Or somebody. Okay, and then there was, he showed the, the second approximation versus the first approximation. So this just reinforces that the random matrix theory really does have something to do. If you take second order terms, then uh, you get a much sharper, uh, the uh, slopes are um, uh, much more concentrated around zero here. And so that indicates that in fact, um, the second approximation is better than the first approximation. And so, uh, so there really is something going on here. Now there's a question about what about, can you do this for rank three? And the answer is no, we don't know how to do this for rank three. And the problem is that um, the conjectural formula for the derivative involves a regulator in Shaw, and there doesn't seem to be a good way to separate these things. The period here is the square root of D, but we don't actually have a good way to discretize to figure out like the smallest value of L prime. And so this is, this is a puzzle that we still don't know. Uh, uh, Nina Snaith calculated uh, the, uh, the moments of uh, the uh, odd orthogonal, so that's a place where you, you have vanishing at, uh, at one, and calculated the, um, the moment of the derivative, and worked out that the rightmost pole is now at minus three halves. So, um, so, so initially we thought we could use that to model this situation, the idea being, well, uh, Shaw is, uh, the regulator is small and the Shaw is small, so the discretization should still be around one over square root of D, maybe log D or log squared or something like that, but on that order. But then when you take the three halves power of D, of square root of D, you get D to the three quarters, and when you sum that, you would then expect X to the one quarter uh, triple vanishings, uh, rank three. So you'd expect X to the one quarter uh, times to have rank three, but uh, Rubin and Silverberg already showed examples where there were uh, more than that, x to the one-third and, and, and higher. So that's just plain wrong. And we've sort of been stuck at that ever since. Um, but, uh, but you can still do, uh, curiously, you can still do um, this thing about vanishing in arithmetic progressions, and that still seems to work. Now, uh, if you want to know about triple zeros, uh, when D is a square mod P versus a non-square mod P, then it, it's the same thing as, as uh, for the rank two situation, but there we had a minus one half, and now you have sort of minus three halves. <laughs> and uh, there's a small amount of data to, um, to look at that. This is uh, Elke's data about the rank three twist of congruent number curve. So this is the prime. This is the number of rank threes in square residue classes and in non-square residue classes modulo that prime. And uh, this, is, uh, this column is the ratio of those two, and this is the conjecture uh, here with this minus three halves. And that seems to be, I mean, we don't have as much data, but it seems like it works. Uh, and so even though we don't even know the right power on x, for how many of these vanishings triple, uh, how many, how often the rank, uh, the quadratic twist should have rank three, right, for d up to x. We don't even know what the power of x should be. We would have said x to the one quarter, except for Rubin and Silverberg. Maybe it's x to the three quarters, so that um, rank two and rank three are the same, uh, but we just don't know. But nevertheless, you can take this ratio. The minus three halves pole is still relevant apparently, and, uh, and so you have this. So I, I think that's sort of an interesting situation that you can still do this ratio experiment and it still seems to work. But um, it sort of, it led us to wonder, you know, see L, L half chi D can be as small as one over square root of D, but how small can L prime of a half chi D be? And it doesn't seem like it can be maybe as small as one over square root of D. And it's almost like the situation in the class number problem where your regulator times your class, uh, times your class group has size uh, square root of D, right? But there's a big difference because that's over on the edge of the critical strip and your L function you really can bound uh, uh, above and below, at least assuming the Riemann hypothesis. Whereas in the center of the critical strip, you don't have any such control like that. And so there's a real question here how small can that, uh, 
can that L function be? And we suggested, we, somehow we came to the conclusion that maybe it could be, that it could be as uh, small as, uh, that there is somehow this extra one-sixth here, that the product of those two things are maybe always bigger than d to the one-sixth. I'm not even sure now how, where we came up with that, but I don't think that's true. That there's a connect, the point is that there should be, that it seems like there's a connection between, in elliptic cur here, between the regulator and Shaw. Like if Shaw is big, you can't have them both be uh, independently small, for example. They're not independent, okay? So it's like in the class number formula, but it's at the center of the critical strip. But nobody seems to be able to uh, shed any light on this. So this is a question. And if you look at, so here's L prime values uh, uh, for d up to 10 to the 6. But if you, if you zoom in on this, this is actually what it looks like. There's this big jump here. That's kind of what I'm talking about. And if you do the same graph, but for L values, um, I mean, these are, really are discretized. But the discretization is fine enough here that you can actually even see it on that. Whereas for L prime, it's, it's huge. Anyway. Now, you can do the same thing for uh, modular forms of weight 4 or 6 or whatever weight you want. And then, interestingly, for weight 4, this will lead to the suggestion that there should be about x to the 1 quarter L function. You take an L function of a modular a cusp form of um, weight 4 and do its quadratic twist and look at the uh, central value, and you should have double zeros about x to the 1 quarter of the time for d's up to x. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly what this, this has something to do with Chow groups, but I don't actually, I couldn't tell you the arithmetic meaning of it. Probably somebody in here could. But for six, uh, you only expect finitely many. Uh, the point is that the discretization for uh, weight k is d to the k minus one over two. So when k is four, that's d to the uh, three quarter, uh, for three halves, and then that becomes three quarters when you take the square root from the, that pole of the orthogonal matrices, and then you sum that and you get x to the one quarter. But for six, it would be five halves, take the square root of that, that's five quarters, and you sum that, well, that's a convergent series, and so you only expect finitely many vanishings. And uh, there's a limited amount of data. Here's twists up to 100 million of the level seven weight four cusp form. There's only... Um, 1,155 uh, 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 double vanishings, even vanishings of order at least two. So it's not very many. But you can, again, arrange them into arithmetic progressions. Now the random matrix prediction, you have to, you have to go through and figure out what the moments should be. The, you still need the minus one-half moment, but this is a different family. It's a, you know, the weight four, and now it's, this is what comes out. And here's the... Uh, the data versus the prediction. And it's, you know, there's, I don't know if you think that's convincing or not, but, uh, but so you can do that. And now, this is something that uh, I don't think anybody's done, but I would like to see. Right, there's two A's going on here, and so that's slightly confusing. I'm using AP as a Dirichlet series coefficient, but also sort of uh, A minus, well, the, the, A, the arithmetic factor that comes from the moments, we also use the letter A for. So that's slight, that could be confusing there. But. OK, so now what if you do this for degree 4 L functions? So with two, two gamma factors, like this. OK, these could be like spinner zeta functions of genus 2 Ziegel modular forms, or Hilbert modular forms for a real quadratic field, or Rankine-Selbergs of two degree 2 L functions, or a symmetric cube or the Haas of AL function of a hyperelliptic curve of genus 2. So these would all lead to L functions whose functional equation looks like this, with an epsilon equals plus or minus 1. And um, I think it would be interesting to find uh, like examples here where you could do quadratic twists and find like a whole you know, slew of double zeros from this family. And I think really all it depends on if you're just doing quadratic twists, I think it just depends on the A and B here. And if your A and B are small enough, then I think you would, find, you would expect infinitely many double vanishings from the, uh, the quadratic twists. So um, for example, well, if you had Rankine-Selberg, if you're doing a Rankine-Selberg of a weight K and a weight L, 
then your A is zero and your B is K plus L over two minus one. So if K and L are both two, then B would be one here and you'd have, so you'd have A is zero and B is one. Or for a hyperelliptic curve, you'd have A and B are both a half. And so those would both be nice situations. Or Hilbert modular forms with parallel weight K and L, if K and L are both two, then you'd have a half-half there. Uh, or a Ziegel modular form of weight two, uh, you'd also get a half-half there. Symmetric cube, uh, if K is two, you have a half and, and three halves. But, uh, but so what's the point? Well, so I think, I don't know if this for sure, but I think that um, the central value might be something like some constant over uh, root q to the a plus b. Actually, I'm not so sure about that. But I think if you twist by, if you do a quadratic twist by d, so that q goes to qd squared, then I think you'll have a discretization that looks like this. And again, I don't really know much about these special values, so somebody in the audience maybe uh, uh, can tell me. Uh, uh, I think these are all, I think there are formulas known for all these special values of, is that right? Does anybody know? Okay, well I think there's formulas known. Um, uh, and I think this would come out around d to the a plus b. So if, uh, and then when you do your, uh, this is going to be an orthogonal family. You take one of these L functions, you do quadratic twists of it, it'll be an orthogonal family. And, um, if that's a value, you get to take the square root because of the pole, you know, at minus one half. And so you'd be summing something like this. So as long as a plus b is, well, if it's smaller than two, then you're gonna have a positive uh, power of x on your vanishings. And, uh, and even if it is two, well, there'll be some power of log. So even when a plus b is two, you could possibly still get infinitely many uh, vanishings here. But so, for example, if you had a hyperelliptic curve of genus 2 and you twist by all the quadratic characters, you probably would find around x to the half uh, values for which the L function has a double zero. And so I think that would be interesting for somebody to check out. And uh, you should be able also to split those d's up into arithmetic progressions, go through, uh, you know, figure out what you think the, um, you know, the moments of that family are and look at the minus one-half moment, right? And look at the arithmetic factor there and compare that for the, your two different residue classes. And so you should be able to make a prediction about how these things are distributed in, in residue classes. So I'm, I think that would be interesting if somebody uh, wanted to do that. Now this is, uh, uh, this is an email from Mark Watkins. I asked him... Uh, Did you get his permission before putting this on the <laughs> Oh, hmm. <laughs> Right, so I said, well, you know, so for the, uh, the for curve I showed you, at, for, the, for the congruent number curve, uh, and for the curve I showed you at the first, the xq plus y cubed equals m, you actually have x to the 5 6, which is bigger than 3 quarters, because there's sort of extra automorphisms in, in those two cases. For the congruent number curve, not counting congruent numbers, but if you actually do all the twists, all the, the quadratic twists over q of i of that, you can actually produce this family with x to the 7 8 uh, double zeros. And so then I was wondering if you could do that in this uh, case, you know, could you, and so I asked Mark if he could give an example of a hyperelliptic curve where you would have these extra automorphisms that would then even give more than x to the one-half vanishings. And so, yeah, uh, so he says, uh, yeah, for genus two curves, there are cases where one can compute, see Cardona's, Cardona's thesis. Yes, I've actually read it in Catalan, all the twists here. And then, uh, well, then he mentioned specifically this x113 curve, and you get these two, you get these two twists, and so you have these two families, and so presumably, I don't know uh, actually how, what that would work out with, but uh, that should give you even more than x to the one-half double zeros. Now, Mark did do the symmetric cube of an elliptic curve, uh, and here the prediction is about log x to the c double vanishings, and here he does work out, the, uh, he writes down what the, uh, what the um, so the analog of the Birch, Swinnerton, and Dyer conjecture in this case. And you, so you, you do have this, this d to the, uh, well, d to the 3 halves and d to the 1 half. So d squared, you take its square root, you get d. And so you just barely, so you expect just barely to have infinitely many vanishings. 
Now he actually found quite a lot. He did some calculations here, and it seemed like there were a lot more than some, you know, just a power of log x, but uh, it's a limited amount of data. You, it looks like more than x said three fourths. I mean, that's why. It, I mean, oh yeah, yeah there were. The well, that was um, that thing that Zagier did. Is that what you're talking about? When he thought it might be a positive proportion, right. but that was for was that for the congruent number? That was for some a specific curve, I think. Where, yeah. I'm not making a comment. I'm saying like in short. Right. It did look like it could be. I mean, when you have x to three quarters times the power of log, it is hard to tell that from x for small amounts of data. Okay, so I want to just finish. Um, this is actually, I don't think Barry's here, but he asked us a question um, about uh, if you have an elliptic curve and you look at the family of symmetric powers, can the central value be zero infinitely often? And I believe he conjectured that no, it wouldn't be. And so he asked if we could uh, analyze that using uh, random matrix theory. And uh, so uh, Nina Snaith and I looked at this and um, we couldn't decide if the symmetric powers really does make a family. It definitely doesn't sort of fit the description in the, the integral moments of L functions paper of Farmer, Keating, Rubenstein, Snaith. Um, and, but, so we looked at an easier question. Would, suppose you just start with a CM elliptic curve and do its symmetric powers. Well then it's, not, it's no longer a primitive L function, but the part of it that's new uh, with each uh, symmetric power is just, uh, you just get a, uh, the L function of a, a Grossen character, um, and uh, the weight, it's, it's basically the L function of a modular form, but with increasing weight. So it's like looking at a family where you're just taking one L function, or you take a modular form of weight K for, uh, for an increasing sequence of Ks. And um, so the question is, was that, uh, uh, can we say anything about that? And um, well, let's see. So, uh, so we decided to follow a paper of Gross and Zagier and look at, in a specific case, uh, the Grossen character for Q square root of minus seven. So this actually corresponds to elliptic curve of um, conductor 49. And uh, so we're working over Q square root of minus seven. So the norm of an integer is a squared plus ab plus two b squared. You have the zeta function is the product of the Riemann zeta function and the Dirichlet L function of modulus uh, seven, uh, and uh, the Hecke character, so chi of a plus b times one plus root minus seven over two is uh, a number that's plus or minus one times a plus b one plus root minus seven over two. And that number is determined by uh, plus or minus by this congruence right here. Okay, and so you get this uh, Hecke L function, and um, you can take, uh, it's like I said, it's the L function of this elliptic curve, and, but you can take powers of this character, and these give you the L functions uh, that I was talking about associated with the symmetric powers. Uh, and uh, you just take a plus b to the 2n minus 1 and then times that same Legendre symbol. And that has this functional equation. Uh, now, this, uh, I'm doing the nth power here. Uh, the center of the critical strip is s equals n. And uh, you can write down a formula for the central value just sort of in the usual way using the uh, functional equation. And it gets expressed like this in terms of the uh, incomplete gamma function. And so you have this formula for the, um, this explicit formula for the central value of this um, sort of 2n minus 1 uh, Hecke character associated with this elliptic curve. Now, uh, Gross and Zagier uh, conjectured a formula for the central value. It looks like this. You have this uh, period omega to the 2n minus 1, and then divided by n minus 1 factorial, and then times um, a n, where a n is twice the square of an integer. Now, uh, okay, so I've written n instead of k, but n is the weight. The weight is actually uh, 2n or 2, uh, 
uh, I forget what it is, but it's somewhere around 2n for the weight here. But you have an n factorial down there. So that seems like, uh, so we're, if we'd like to use, sort of do random matrix theory on this, we, this, is, um, this is your discretization. But the n factorial, the k factorial, is, I mean, that's exponentially small. And so it's kind of a, it's kind of a strange thing here. In the other situation, where we just had the elliptic curve and we were twisting it, we got these numbers, the cd, so an plays the role of the, you know, sort of cd squared. And those were integers, but, you know, lots of times they were 1 and 4 and 9 and so on. But in this case, um, here's a table from Gross and Zagia. You can see the AKs actually grow. And so that, that leads to the, uh, the question, actually, how, you know, how big or how small can this thing actually be? What it, the discretization is not obvious, and so it's not clear how to apply you know, the random matrix theory to this situation to try and uh, you know, do some information. But uh, I got this email from Matt Young. <laughs> And he did say I could use it. <laughs> uh, but this is really interesting. In fact, I just got this this morning, and it exactly addresses this question. He conjectures that the minimum, uh, when you go up to weight k, the minimum L value at the central point should be k to the minus 4, basically. And he has a little argument for it, which um, he sent me, but I don't have it here. But anyway, so it should be around k to the minus 4. And so uh, in that last situation, then, it, it really should be uh, n to the minus 4 as sort of the minimum. And if that's the case, then your random matrix theory would say you're only going to have finitely, you know, at most finitely many uh, times that the, the L value is 0 when you march up through this weight. I mean, in that example, there weren't any. Um, and uh, actually, um, so Nina and I actually computed the first, uh, the first, moment asymptotically in the second moment with an upper bound. And actually, you can combine those then to uh, conclude, in fact, that um, at least sort of if n goes up to n, then at least uh, you know, n over log n or maybe log squared of n of them cannot be 0. So certainly some of them are not. They're not they can't all be 0. It's, uh, but uh, anyway, um, I have. Uh, I have a little bit of that calculation, but I don't know if I should really go through this. But uh, yeah, so it, it turns out that you can, um, you, can, you can evaluate the first moment asymptotically. I think I'm going to skip this. And uh, we wind up with it, the, the MNs. So this does seem like a family of, even though you just got one from each you know, L function from each weight, it did behave like a family. We evaluated the first moment, 2n times uh, uh, L1 chi 7. And the second moment uh, can give an upper bound for. And uh, then just by using Cauchy's uh, inequality, you can get that at, uh, at most, uh, that at least n over log n of these uh, L functions don't vanish. So that's some, some number of these things that don't vanish. And uh, I'll just maybe conclude with a couple questions. So one is, um, do the symmetric powers of a non-CM elliptic curve, where the degree is actually going up, right? You have the first one is degree 2, then the symmetric square is degree 3, symmetric cube is degree 4. And so you're asking, is it, you know, does, does it make sense to take, I mean, you know, can you make any sense out of averages, uh, say, of the L value at the central point of an increasing uh, collection of, you know, higher symmetric powers. Uh, there's definitely some issues there. Uh, and then this is a question that Matt may have uh, answered. Uh, is that k to the minus fourth? Uh, I don't know if anybody ever asked that question before, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, what if, OK, in this whole thing, uh, when we're doing these quadratic twists of elliptic curves, I was always, the elliptic curves have integer uh, coefficients, right? And so your discretization, when you're, your special value, it's an integer square, you know, divided by square root of d. But what if you're in, over a quadratic, a real quadratic field, and your integers could be really small, for example, because of, uh, you know, because of, of units. So what happens in the situation where you take a, 
weight two cusp form, but the, the coefficients are uh, in a, let's say, in a real quadratic field. Does, does this still work? Do you get, you know, when you twist, do you get zeros or not? So I don't know. Um, okay, so what are the double, so how do you interpret the, the values of these L functions? Again, I think somebody knows the answer to this, but not me. So what does it mean if you have a, a double zero for the twists of these degree four L functions? I mean, what does it mean geometrically, I guess? And same thing, but for the weight four modular forms. That, I think, has something to do with Chow groups. Uh, what if you do odd weights? So nobody, we haven't looked at this at all if you started with a weight one or a weight three thing. So I have no idea what happens there. Uh, find degree four examples with extra symmetries. So that's like the Watkins may have answered that, at least given a couple of examples. Uh, and maybe for your degree four, maybe you can find some family where, um, you know, uh, where you could actually get, uh, you actually expect a positive power of uh, triple zeros. And uh, you can look at the, uh, you know, sort of triple zeros in arithmetic progressions. And then, uh, again, I don't know this, uh, with, the, um, with the quadratic twists of the elliptic curves or of the, you know, modular forms of whatever degree, you can always express the answer in terms of the coefficients of theta series. You have linear combinations of theta series, right? So is there something like that for uh, degree four L functions? I mean, there's the Bursher conjecture about the, special, the central values of the uh, Ziegel uh, modular forms. I don't know if that can be con uh, computed quickly. I kind of doubt it. Do you know, Nathan? Not likely. Not likely. But so is there anything that corresponds to the theta series that would lead to a quick way to actually compute, uh, you know, values of the quadratic twists? So, okay. Let's see. Thank you.